it's time that I get into incels! Everyone's favorite least controversial topic! No! Yes! No! Yes! No! So I made a video on the problems that I have with modern day female villains. Well, I guess it was more like two, since I also did a response to Dire Gentleman's quote unquote debunk of it. But because I used the dreaded word female to describe characters who were female girls and sometimes non humans, I had a few people calling me an incel. This luckily gave me some inspiration. I was going to do a video on modern male villains, but then I got a better and more unique idea. As far as I'm aware, where no one has done a video on this topic. Sure, there are people going over specific villains who are incels, but as far as I'm aware, no one has done a full video on the concept of villain incels. Now, of course, before we begin, we need to define what an incel actually is. According to people who don't like me, it's my reflection. Which, uh, okay, that may be true, but you don't have to point it out. The definition of an incel is someone who's involuntarily celibate. Sometimes a virgin, but usually just someone who can't currently get laid. But as humans are well known to do, they usually just use this term as a catch-all insult for people they don't like. Like, I remember Daft Pina called Young Don an incel like before me. he changed the title of it who, by the way, is an attractive married man. I, I don't think he's involuntarily celibate. Sure, you could definitely call him homophobic and sexist as well. He's still not an incel. And there are literally millions of people who call Andrew Tate an incel. The dude is rich, <laughs> successful, famous, and he has shown he can easily get with tons of attractive women. When you really get down to it, he's pretty much the furthest thing away from an incel. Him being a domestic ab a trafficker, and a whole bunch of other bad things does not make him an incel. This one person who has a massive hate book for Andrew Tate told me, He's still an incel at the end of the day because those are just pick-me-girls. Now the term pick-me-girl is basically the left-wing equivalent of soy boy or simp. Oh, uh, that guy likes Star Wars The Last Jedi? Wow, what a soy boy. Oh my god, that guy's a fan of Lindsay Ellis? <laughs> wow, what a simp. Basically, it's a meaningless insult to design to dismiss people who are a fan of a thing you don't like. I'm gonna be honest here, a lot of those women are pretty damn attractive and I think they could get a lot of guys they want. Some women, hashtag not all women, are attracted to rich, powerful, dominant men. Him also being incredibly buff also probably really helps his chances, along with the fact that he looks like a human version of me. It's certainly a lot rarer today, but I've also seen attractive women with fat guys every now and then. Granted, I see attractive men with fat girls more often, but maybe that's just me. Men, women, and whatever gender people want to identify with are just attracted to, well, things that they are attracted to. Me and my roommate are attracted to completely different women. Now, unfortunately, we tend to attract the women the other one of us wants, but oh well. Now, the last thing I want to say before we move on to the incel villains is that I don't really care about Andrew Tate. Me saying he's not an incel is not a defense of him. Me saying that as far as I'm aware, Robert E. Lee didn't eat babies is not a defense of the guy. If you hate Andrew Tate, well, I'm not here to stop you, but I will tell you that you're wrong if you call him an incel. I'm just so sick of this guy. He's like the new Donald Trump. Media along with social media just has to talk about him all the time everywhere. And I guess I'm being a hypocrite because now I'm guilty of that as well. But I think we at long last established what an incel is. Someone who does villainous deeds because he couldn't get with a woman. So let's go over some villains that fit this definition. Let's start with the best and most well-known, Titan. Someone who even predates the term incel before it became popular. Al Stewart was just a normal guy, with a job as a cameraman constantly filming Roxanne the reporter. Reporters are usually, for the most part, pretty attractive people, who also put on a very welcoming and charming personality for the camera. Hal doesn't have a very good looking face. He's short, overweight, doesn't really have any muscles to speak of, bad hair, he has no sense of style, is socially awkward, and on top of everything else, he's poor. We can clearly see what kind of apartment he has. He straight up says to someone he thinks is robbing him that the lady next door has way nicer stuff than his. Now sure, the average cameraman for the news makes $28 to $58 an hour. That ain't too bad at all, but considering he lives in Metro City, which just looks like New York but cleaner, rent is more than likely extremely high. And I also don't think he works all that many hours at his job. But all of those things are not truly what makes him an incel. He also makes presumably no effort to improve himself. He's narcissistic 
statistic entitled Jealous of People, Prone to Violent Outburst. But most of all, he's obsessed with a woman who clearly does not show any affection towards him. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck, man? When you really get down to it, he doesn't know the true her. He has mostly only seen the face she puts on for the camera when they're filming. Very creepily, he tries to trick her into coming to his place, saying that there's a party. Being that he's a socially inept loser who's never been to an adult party in his life, he tells her that there's a bouncy house instead of alcohol and weed. And then he makes himself even more socially awkward, thinking that the issue he made was saying that there was a bouncy house in Aunt Clowns. Now you probably won't catch this the first time you see this movie, but when you look at his apartment, it's clear to everyone that a bouncy house can't fit in there. Heavily suggesting in a subtle way that he was just trying to trick her into coming to his place. Would he have attempted to make a move on her, failing spectacularly? Or would he just chicken out and not even try? Or possibly try something much more nefarious? Well, she's an attractive woman who's been in situations like this before, so she did a smart thing and said no. I think one of the best things about the superhero genre is asking the question, what if this type of person got superpowers? My favorite comic book, Superman Red Sun, is about a superpowered dictator. Static Shock is about what if gangsters had superpowers. Oh, the Incredibles is about what if a whole family had superpowers, and they still had to deal with their family issues. I myself have an idea for a short web comic I would like to make. The working title is Senior Superheroes. It's a story about superheroes in a retirement home. And it's been done before. For example, a guy with super strength who also has arthritis. Or a guy with psychic powers who's suffering from dementia. Megamind decides to answer the question of what if an incel got superpowers. Hal becomes Titan. He's tall, extremely muscular, and gets a new sense of confidence. As soon as he receives these abilities, he doesn't even consider the ramifications. He's just over the moon about it. He's far more interested in the wealth, fame, and success this could bring than what he can do with it to help people. As soon as he realizes how hard it is being a hero. He starts stealing stuff and sits on his ass playing video games. He can fly, has super strength and heat vision, but he would still rather spend his time playing Mass Effect 2. This movie was released in 2010. That game just released. And honestly, I don't blame him. He's told that all he has to do to get the girl he likes is save her. But he's too impatient and socially inept to wait for Megamind to do it. So he does it by putting her in danger himself and then saving her. He had complete tunnel vision. All he could think was, Oh, I shave her and then she will be mine. I'll put her in danger and, and then I'll save her. She has to like me. No. Instead of trying to see things from her perspective, asking himself, would she like this? Would this work? When he doesn't get what he wants, he starts lashing out. He's no longer just a normal guy who will just punch a news van, then go home. He can now murder the woman who rejected him and destroy the city full of the people who looked down upon him. What would happen if you gave someone like him superpowers is obvious, because with great power comes great responsibility, and he never had any responsibility. Megamind, despite being a villain, had his his life forced upon him, but it was the only life he knew and he tried to make the best of it. Once the status quo was broken, with his dream of destroying Metro Man finally coming true, he felt unfulfilled. He was not happy with being a villain when there was no one around to oppose him. He was doing what he could to return to that simple status quo, but when he became friends with Roxanne and then eventually started to fall in love with her, he found a new purpose in life with something that brings him far more happiness. He had a lot of second thoughts and it was difficult for him. But in the end, he did regret his life decisions, and he decided to move forward with his life, improving himself as a person greatly. Titan, on the other hand, despite all the powers he was given, never changed on the inside. He's a deeply unsympathetic villain, and he's, in my opinion, the best incel villain that has ever been made. Now we just got one more good incel villain that I know about, before we get to all the bad ones. And that's the Nowhere King from Centaur World. Okay, so I assume most of you have already seen Megamind, but if you haven't seen Centaur World yet, it's on Netflix, go check it out. Be warned, there's a lot of singing in it, like three to five songs an episode. Even the Wiz is looking at this movie saying, Jesus, another song? Well, I guess it's been more than a minute. Okay, this is your final warning, because I'm about to go into 
into major spoilers about the Nowhere King's identity. The Nowhere King is this creepy skull of a deer with the black slimy body of No Face from Spirited Away. Every other creature is a generic animal, a human, some form of minotaur, some form of centaur, or a crazy looking mutant that is the fusion of a whole bunch of creatures. The Nowhere King looks extremely different from everyone else, so what's his backstory? How did he end up becoming like this? Well, the leader of the humans, known as the General, who has been fighting against Minotaurs for several years now, sings probably my favorite song in the entire series. Cause if we move as one, our side can win the war. My army's here and we're the best at slaying Minotaurs. With him saying to the Nowhere King, Hello, Black Mirror, my oldest enemy. He says this because they are actually the same person. Just like with Kami and Piccolo, the General and the Nowhere King split off from the same being, who was a brilliant Elktar with the job of repairing the rift between the human and the centaur world. Of course, the nameless son of Katat did what he did so he could become pure of heart, the good one being Kami, and his expunged evil becoming Piccolo. But the Elktar by the name of... um... Uh, I don't think they actually ever say his name. I don't think it's Elktar because that's his species, not his name. Uh, whatever, it's unimportant to this video. Uh. He, on the other hand, splits himself into two beings to get with a woman. Now, he's extremely different from Hal in almost every single way. He's highly intelligent, good looking, has a pretty nice place, is well respected in both the human and centaur world, and most importantly, the princess is clearly interested in him. But she is a human, he's a centaur. It could never work between them. Even though the average deer dick is similar in length to a human dick, it's only roughly an inch shorter, but he thinks his small dick is going to give him blue balls. So using extensive research, along with materials from both worlds, he creates a device that will keep the rift stable. But it can also do other things, such as what I can only describe as soul splitting. After foolishly testing the soul splitter only one time, instead of a whole bunch of times, which is the proper scientific method, he uses it on himself. You see, he tested it on a rutabaga tar, and it split into a baby and a rutabaga. So I guess he came to the conclusion that if he used it on himself, he would split into a human and an elk. At the very least, I think he should have also done a test run on a mole tar. Those things are blind. They wouldn't see it coming. A rutabaga can't move around. It doesn't have any eyes, ears, a mouth, or anything. So if there was a consciousness in both the baby and the rutabaga, you really wouldn't be able to tell because a rutabaga can't do it anything. So when he uses a soul splitter on himself, he does become a human and an elk, which is what he wanted, but his elk half has the same consciousness as his human half. The human half is able to leave Centaur World behind, a place he didn't enjoy being in. He gets to live it up, being well respected in the human world, and also marries the princess. Meanwhile, the elk is no longer welcome in either world. He no longer has his hands, and he's sleeping in alleyways while eating garbage. He eventually can't take it anymore, he arranges a meeting between himself and his human half, asking him if they could become one again. The human half having everything he could have ever wanted, of course says no. When the elk threatens to tell the princess the truth, the human half tries to drown the elk half like Disney stocks right now, but he learns that they're connected. If one dies, the other dies. Just like my career if Disney falls, if they're gone, what am I going to talk about? So he gets his men to capture his elk half, and they lock it up in a small, deep, dark cell without even a window to give him any light. After 10 years, the princess discovers him and helps him escape. He gets the soul splitting device and instead of using it for soul fission, he uses it for soul fusion. Combining humans with other creatures that are directly under his control. I don't belong anywhere. Building himself an army of minotaurs. Going to war against both worlds simultaneously. I don't know how he was able to pull this off within the rift. You would think with both the centaur and human city being on each side of the rift that people would pass through this place constantly and it would be the most secure place in both of their worlds. Boy, I sure hope someone got fired for that blunder. After using the device for soul fusion over and over, it eventually mutated his body into something completely unrecognizable, much like your girlfriend before she puts on her makeup in the morning, turning him into the feared 
nowhere king. So what does any of this have to do with incels? I mean, the general clearly got with the princess, so he can't be the incel. So it's either the Nowhere King or the Elktar. And the answer is, it's actually all three of them. Here's why. The Elktar is, of course, the shortest one to explain. Despite having a brilliant mind and a body that the princess is into, he's still not happy with the way he looks and he wants to change it. Mind you that the princess is not the sole reason for his decision, but she was the straw that broke the camel's back. Now, now, as I've mentioned earlier, wanting to improve yourself and taking steps towards it is not what an incel does. That being said, he's not thinking over the ramifications of what he's doing to change himself. Think of it like this, let's say you're into a girl, but you're scrawny and she would probably want you more if you were buff. So you start working out, or in the Elktar's case, removing your horns because you're horny. But it's not working fast enough, so you start abusing steroids to get that body you want. She's just a girl, eventually one day you won't even give a fuck about her. But in this moment, you're destroying your body. You were scared of rejection, so instead of trying to ask her out, you did this first. Same with the Elktar, before even trying to ask her out, he went to drastic measures, which eventually led to the creation of the Nowhere King, causing so much unneeded death and destruction in both worlds. Sure, I guess you could say that there was no way he could have ever predicted something like this would happen, but for however long it was going on, he never even tried to refuse with his other half. As for the Nowhere King, just like with Titan, he couldn't get what he wanted. That caused him to suffer. So he decided to start causing suffering. As the old saying goes, misery does love company. Instead of going straight for building an army to get revenge, he could have used that device to try to figure out a way to make himself whole again. Maybe he could have combined his elk body with another human. He would still have his emotional and psychological scars of being imprisoned for 10 years. He would have gone without revenge, and the chances of him ending up with the princess would have been slim to none. But there was a chance she would have left his human half and come to find him, possibly starting their relationship over from the beginning. Or maybe eventually he would have found love somewhere else. Of course, the life that the Nowhere King had to deal with was a million times worse than anything Titan had to ever go through. We can empathize with the Elk, we can't do the same for Hal, but both of the different roads they walked on still led them to the same destination, and that destination was causing pain and suffering to those around you. And as for the general, the decade he was with the princess, he probably was in celibate, if you know what I mean. Once she found out his secret and left him for pretty good reasons, he became obsessed with finding her and getting back together. Well, it's not exactly said or implied, I think it's entirely possible that he was more focused on that than defeating the Minotaur army. But that's just pure headcanon on my part, it's not evidenced by any means. He still has respect, status, and success. The main human girl known as Ryder is clearly interested in him, but he only has eyes for one woman. All he can think about is taking back what he lost instead of moving on with someone else. It's not outright said, but it's slightly implied that he's been celibate since the princess went missing. Sure, he's not exactly what we typically think an incel is. Hell, he seems like the opposite in a lot of ways, but he's a guy who just couldn't handle rejection. And in the end of the series, we see where that gets him in life. Let me ask you something, if you had this soul fission device, would you split your soul in two? Creating two beings, one with all your positive aspects and the other with all your negative traits. Kind of like that movie Twins from 1988, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. We all have aspects of our body we don't like. Whether you were born with a gender you don't want to be, you're too fat, too skinny, too short, too tall. The list could go on and on. Just picture in your mind the worst version of yourself and the best version of yourself. If your consciousness was in the best version of yourself, would you lock up the worst version of yourself in a cage and keep them there 
forever? Most people would say no, but you know in your heart what is the true answer. So the Nowhere King and Titan are my examples of how an incel villain is done well, but how are they done wrong? Now I want to make this clear, we're going through incels, not just pathetic male villains. Sure, the Admiral of the First Order from Star Wars The Last Jedi is never seen with a woman and is absolutely pathetic, but he's not an incel. That one guy in the female Thor comics who said that Thor can't be a woman and that feminist ruined everything, just before he got his ass handed to him, is also not an incel villain. Some of you may say Kylo Ren is a good example of an incel villain, but to be honest, it's kind of a gray area to me. Yes, he did ask Rey to join him, but that was more of a join forces kind of way, not a join me in marriage baby way. And also Rey does kiss him in the end, so uh, she clearly saw something in this guy. The first poorly done incel villain is Skeletor from Masters of the Universe, revelations. As far as I'm aware, there has been no iteration of He-Man where Skeletor has done anything remotely incel-y. Skeletor literally says to Tila's diverse black friend, who still hasn't done anything in the series, Look at my face, child. It has phrased for me a lonely life in which none would have me as a man. This line didn't add anything to the story, it didn't develop the plot more, and it's completely clumsily thrown in. It just comes out of nowhere. So everything Skeletor has done, through all the wars he has started, all the times he has tried to kill He-Man, become a master of the universe himself, try to destroy the universe on at least one occasion, and just everything else, he did all of this because he was ugly and women didn't find him attractive. And in season two, when he finally has He-Man's sword, something that he has desired for so long that he used to make himself into a master of the universe. Evil Lynn just takes it from him by using her feminine charm to get him to drop his guard. There was no need for the writers to make him into an incel. This is such a stupid plot point. I would like to say more about Skeletor, but he's barely in this show. Plus, I really don't care that much about He-Man. I do understand that it does have its fans, but at the end of the day, it's just a cartoon from the 80s designed to sell toys. Hello, Editing Jar here. I showed this video to a few people so they could look it over, and one of them was a boomer. Apparently, He-Man was a lot more culturally significant than I once thought. Before it came out, cartoons were not allowed to advertise anything to children. Now, of course, eventually this was changed by President Ronald Reagan. And if you know anything at all about cartoons, then you should know the reason why the modern ones look so good. It's not because of the money they generate from being on TV, DVD sales, or anything like that. The overwhelming majority of the money they generate is from merchandising. Basically, around this time, almost 90% of animation was made by the Hanna-Barbera Company. You know what I'm talking about, that animation that was not only cheap, but constantly reused. That's the reason why He-Man looks as cheap as it does. TV animation was essentially on its last leg, and thanks to the breakout success that He-Man was, the industry was saved. So yeah, while He-Man may not have been as culturally significant as Superman, Lord of the Rings, or Mickey Mouse, every single cartoon that came out after it owes the man with the power of Grey Skull a lot of gratitude. It's a complete fact that without this show's existence, every single cartoon nowadays would have a much lower budget. So yeah, it's not just a cartoon from the 80s, it's actually really important. It's not a cultural phenomenon that has stood the test of time like Lord of the Rings or something. Speaking of which, there are very few villains who had an impact on our pop culture as much as Sauron has. I don't think there's a single Dark Lord archetype as popular as he is. I wouldn't say he created it, but he certainly popularized the concept of a villain who's more like a force of nature than a person. Someone our heroes never directly interact with, but his presence is felt everywhere, and we feel the same fear as our heroes do when we think about what would happen if he was successfully revived. Even the Nowhere King took a lot of inspiration from him, but do you know what would make his character even better? Definitely not turning him into an incel, that's for sure. Let's talk about Sauron's betrayal in Rings of Power. Next to Disney, I think Amazon produces the second most TV shows and movies that I just hate. I do plan on making a full review of Rings of Power in the future, but for now, let's just go over Sauron's incel scene. So some brief 
context for those of you who haven't seen the show but are familiar with the books, Galadriel is nothing like she is in the books. She's an adventurous, sword-swinging badass, and so Mary Sueish that she rivals Rey, Mulan, and Captain Marvel. The show takes place just before the construction of the Twenty Rings of Power. Morgoth has been defeated, but Sauron still remains. But he's in disguise, who could it be? Well, perhaps it's this really attractive human who basically reveals he's Sauron with his first line. Galadriel and him become close friends. They go on a few adventures together, and eventually she figures out that he is Sauron. Ah, but Sauron being compelled by her, Mary Sueness falls in love with her. Aw, oh, it's so dreamy. <sighs> He's willing to make up for his past deeds and come to the light all because of her. He will rule over Middle-earth, but not as the Dark Lord, but as a good king with her by his side as his queen. But Galadriel is too much of a girl boss for that and rejects him. Okay, so let me get this straight. Uh. Sauron did a lot of evil, but he was willing to become a good man if he could get some Mary Sue elf pussy, and she rejected him for all the evil he has committed. Now sure, maybe he's manipulating her. She is like the best warrior in the entire series, but he needs an army. Him having her on his side is not going to help him enough. Maybe Galadriel doesn't believe him when he says he's going to be a good king. I don't see why she doesn't take the opportunity to pretend to join him and backstab him when she gets the chance. But the thing is, we'll never know what happens for sure because she rejected him. So in other words, everything evil Sauron does after this point, like everything for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the Hobbit trilogy, all the orcs and other monsters he's created, all the death and destruction his armies have caused for the thousands of years they've been fighting against Middle-earth, was all because a woman rejected him. Wow, what a way to ruin one of the greatest villains of all time. This is just a terrible version of the plot with the Nowhere King. <laughs> Hello, uh, editing jar here again. I think I'm being a little bit too harsh on Gliadriel. Sauron was going to become the Dark Lord regardless. There was already evil in his heart. Sure, it may have given him pause in the moment, but he eventually would have become the Dark Lord. But I also want to explain further on how he's an incel. Incels try to blame their bad actions on someone else, usually women. Basically, if you asked, ugh incel Sauron why he did all the evil things he has done, he would say something along the lines of, We're only here because the Stacy rejected me. The issue here is that both Skeletor and Sauron have never ever had any of their actions influenced by a woman rejecting them. It's an absolutely stupid motivation for a Dark Lord. It's insulting to the character and the fans who like the character, and it completely goes against the original work of the writer or writers who created the IP. It's as if the writers just spit into the face of Tolkien. Like imagine if Hollywood was run by conservatives and they made the witch from Narnia into a blue haired feminist. That would also be cringe. But it also really shows that the idea of ultimate evil in the minds of Hollywood writers is an incel. Whether they're doing this intentionally or subconsciously, it really does show their lack of imagination, how safe and comfortable their lives must be, and their understanding of the real world. Because newsflash, most evil dark lords throughout history weren't incels, at least as far as I know. Remember Andrew Tate? Well, he's currently the most hated man in the media. He's essentially the Dark Lord to the left. And guess what? He's not an incel! I haven't finished Willow yet, and I do plan to do a full review of it. But apparently one of the heroes turns to the dark side after being rejected by every woman in the cast. I don't know if that's true or not, so don't quote me on it. Now, I've done a full review of She-Hulk, if you're interested. But the big bad of the series, Todd, is literally an incel who wants to humiliate She-Hulk, steal her powers, and then kill her. All just because she rejected him. He even has a whole army of other incels backing him. And of course, this army of incels do all the most terrible things, like listening to a Jordan Peterson-like figure, using a website where everyone is anonymous, and above all, they don't like She-Hulk. Yeah, it's obvious what this group is supposed to represent. The website they're all on, Intelligentsia, is clearly based 
off of websites like 4chan and Kiwi Farms. But they do things that members of these websites would never do. First of all, there's obviously no women in the group. Um, Hollywood writers, I hate to break it to you, but there are women on these websites. Just look up Isabella Jane. Yeah. Second of all, they have in real life meetings. Yeah, that's what Kiwi Farms and 4chan are known for. They meet up in real life to discuss their evil plans. Wait a minute, do you actually believe people who use a website where everybody is super anonymous don't meet up? Well, you're an idiot because obviously all of them go to see Jordan Peterson in person. They also have this meeting on the property of one of She-Hulk's former clients. And she goes there on the same night they are having their meeting. But unlike Kiwi Farms and 4chan, these people are focused on only one person, and that's her. It's established several times that they know her every move, so they know who her former clients are. They're not all gonna go to that property to meet up. And they totally would know if she was coming or not. With just a Sky being filmed to go off of, 4chan managed to track down Shia LaBeouf's flag in just a few days. I don't know the full story, but Kiwi Farms tracked down Keffels in a very short amount of time. 4chan or Kiwi Farms would never do something like this, and they would know for sure if she was coming. Even then, she only found them because super convenient things happened at the perfect time. I've already done a full review of She-Hulk. If you want more information, just go check that out. Now, of course, I can go through some more examples, but I think you get the idea of what a bad incel villain is. Sure, I said a lot about Titan and the Nowhere King about how they're well-done incel villains, but you may have noticed that the sections on Skeletor and Sauron are a lot shorter, but that's because because there's not much to say. Skeletor just randomly says, Man, no woman found me attractive, and that's why I'm trying to destroy the universe. And that's it. With Sauron, we at least get a little more. Glad to hear I've done so many terrible things, but you are hotter than the fires of Mount Doom. So I'm thinking about being a good king if you join me. No! Never mind then. I'm gonna rage a war for literally thousands of years because you rejected me. When it comes to Titan, his whole thing was that he was an incel. This is just tacked on randomly for no reason. Or we have terrible shows like She-Hulk that has their terrible straw man incel villains do things that they just would never do. It really shows that they're getting to you when you create a show that costs millions of dollars just to try to make fun of them. And you couldn't even do that right. Listen, there's already plenty of people who don't like incels. You don't need to compare them to Skeletor when he's trying to destroy the universe or the goddamn Dark Lord Sauron. But most of all, you shouldn't try to make fun of them when you don't know the the most basic things about them. God, I hate it, She-Hulk. Now, as I was doing research for this video, looking up what people consider to be incel villains, I discovered that a lot of people do not know what that term means. I didn't mean for this video to be this long, so I'm only gonna go through one, and that is the Walking Phoenix version of Joker, a movie with a much lower budget than most Marvel movies that was also rated R and banned in China, made over a billion dollars making it the most profitable R-rated movie. And I think the most profitable movie to also star a villain. To anyone who hates this movie and believe that only incels and white nationalists like it, keep telling yourself that your enemies are just a small, loud minority of people. It never gets old watching you guys cope. Despite how much the mainstream media and the bootlickers who parrot their points said that this movie is about an incel white nationalist and only a small, loud minority of people will go see it, it broke all expectations. They seem pretty bummed out that none of the theaters were pew pew bang bang but up of course the mainstream media is still butthurt to this day that they lost this fight most people i know who like this movie say it's good but it's by no means anything amazing but they still like to hype it up every now and then just to piss off the mainstream media personally i thought it was okay nothing i would go to see a second time but joker is not an incel and he's not a white nationalist either i hate to break it to you but white nationalists are not known for decreasing the credit score five white guys and finding a black woman attractive. Anyone who calls Joker a white nationalist has literally zero evidence to back up their argument. But is he an incel? Well, by the most strictest definition, I guess so. He doesn't seem to be getting laid all too much. But we all know that the people who call Joker an incel are not calling him an incel for that reason. Now, by the off chance that they are, if you're using the term incel as a derogatory term against a poor man with multiple mental illnesses who was abused as a child and is doing what he can to take care of his mother while also living in New York at a time when the crime was extremely prime. Well, then you're an asshole. But as for the people who are calling him an incel for other reasons, yes, he does hallucinate himself having a relationship with one of his neighbors. 
but I don't think it was voluntary. And in the hallucination, he clearly treated her right. They seem to be getting along, and she's also a single mom. Not a lot of guys find those attractive. Does he say anything bad about women? I don't think so. If you look up Joker incel on YouTube, you'll see video after video on this topic. But what about the Aurora sh Not good thing. In Colorado, the guy who did bad things while they were showing Batman the Dark Knight, he was dressed up and called himself the Joker, right? Well, no. He only picked that theater room that was showing the Batman movie because it was the movie that the most people were going to see. He also claimed that he was never inspired nor ever called himself the Joker. People just think he was because he had dyed reddish, orangish hair? I don't think the Joker ever had that, at least as far as I'm aware. I've seen people try to compare his life to Elliot Rodriguez. Um, you know that guy was filthy rich, right? Joker wasn't? Is it because he's a straight white male who high fives people? Well, he didn't do it because he was straight white and male. He did it the first time out of self-defense. Sure, he chased on the third one and gave him a high five, but he was pumped up on adrenaline. Those three guys are assholes. They were attacking him for his mental condition. And before that, they were harassing a woman. If anything, these guys are the incels. Completely on accident, he became an icon. Things just kept on escalating from there. Once the police identified him, whether he was innocent or guilty, he was going to get arrested for sure. Do you think any judge would allow him to go free after all the chaos he created, intentionally or unintentionally? I think he might have hugged his mother, but that also might have been just in his head. I wasn't really sure about that one. But she also was a terrible person who allowed him to be a late for school. One of his clown co-worker friends was going to snitch on him. So he also high-fived that guy as well. He allowed the midget to live at least. God, that was the funniest scene in any superhero movie. And then finally, with nothing to live for, he went on to that talk show and gave that fat rich guy what he deserved. Sure, what the Joker may or may not have done, because it's very confusing if it's real or just in his head, but let's just say he did all of that stuff, is absolutely bad. Yeah, he's doing it to bad people, but it's still wrong. But it's an origin story about a villain. He's not just a mentally ill person who goes to his work and cleans the place up. He is a mentally ill person who accidentally started a movement and with nothing to live for, decided to just roll with it. His actions are never glorified. There's been shows about criminals before this one. The Godfather is about a mob boss. It's one of the most popular movies of all time. Breaking Bad is about a candy dealer. It's one of the most popular shows of all time. Gone with the Wind is about people. Boners. Technically not illegal at the time, but still fucked up. So why does the mainstream media just hate this movie? movie so much. Well, it's because Joker represents their greatest fear, a lower class mentally ill man rising up to fight the system. Companies like Disney and Amazon can keep saying in their TV shows and movies over and over and over again that capitalism is bad. But of course, every single one of us knows that they don't really mean it. They're just pandering to college students. The Joker is a man who was rejected by society, and because of that, he is going up against it. Most people who have seen this movie empathize with Joker. Joker. They do understand what he's doing is wrong, but they can perfectly understand where he's coming from. You as an average Joe with college debt and a 9 to 5 job in the field you didn't study for, watching this movie in your two bedroom apartment that you share with three other people, you probably said to yourself, man what Joker did was fucked up, but I totally get where that guy is coming from. Society completely sucks. I'm happy that I saw this movie that can understand a little bit of the pain that I'm going through. But to your Hollywood elites who have nothing in common with Joker's upbringing, all they can think to themselves is, oh no, there's gonna be more mesh parades. People are gonna riot and revolt. We're gonna lose some of our power. We need to do something now. And that's the exact reason why they call Joker an incel. It's because just like them, he has been rejected by society. I'm completely confident that in the future, we'll start seeing more and more incel villains. We're already seeing a massive increase in the percentage of men who are still virgins or are not in a relationship. The economy is nowhere near as good as it used to be. Gas prices, food prices, and especially the cost of rent are going up more and more. More now than ever, women all over are terrified that a man is going to Cosby them, and more men than ever are terrified that they'll be falsely accused of Cosbying. The culture war is just getting more and more heated. I feel like every day I hear about Andrew Tate or Cat Black. I don't think men and women in America have ever been this divided in the entire country's lifespan. You did everything right, you went to college, you worked hard. You've never committed a crime in your life, but you're constantly treated like you're going to become the next smash sneezer. You see your favorite IPs being destroyed, shows like She-Hulk constantly berating men. And with the pandemic on top of everything else, you feel more alone and isolated than you ever have before. Or maybe you're a woman. You see people hating on a lot of shows that star female characters. 
Sure, you don't think all those men hate women, but you know at least a few of them do. You hear about Bill Cosby being released on the news. You see mass sneezers on the news, along with a whole bunch of other male criminals. You have to be careful with how you make yourself look. If you're too unattractive, men won't approach you. If you're too attractive, men will be afraid to approach you. You're at a higher risk for catching an STD, and you can unwillingly become pregnant. Oh god, it's that time of the month again. On the same day, they want you to work a 14-hour shift. Maybe next year you'll get some use out of that degree. Then you constantly hear about how evil Andrew Tate is, and how he's radicalizing incels. This makes you trust men a little bit less. You're not going on as many dates as you used to. Meaning more guys are lonely, making more of them into incels. Making women fear them more, making more men into incels. And on and on as an infinite loop that feeds back into itself. One could say it's enough to make anyone crazy. And now you should finally know why the media is just so afraid. If we could somehow reach into the fictional world and explain to the Joker all the controversy his movie has created, I think he would laugh and say, that's pretty funny. Whoa, now, it's not time for the credits just yet. I want to let you guys know that if you enjoyed this video about incel villains, then you should also check out the video I just did with Manga Common about robot villains. So in a way, these two videos are about me. Robots and incels. Okay. I'll link it down below in both the pinned comment and a description. I also want to let you guys know that I recently went to VidCon and I had a lot of fun. I enjoyed meeting some of you. Oh, and by the way, Greg, for the love of God, change your shirt. That thing is really old. I plan to go to VidCon next year, so I hope some of you show up so I can meet you guys. I hope that by the end of next week, I will finally finish my full review of The Witcher Blood Origin. But it came out to being way longer than expected, so I want to warn you guys, it might be a few days late. We're about to get to the credits and end the video, but one of my $5 patrons made a request for me to say a line. Bloody Eclipse wanted me to say, we live in a funny, yet terrifying world. If any of you want me to say a line at the end of one of my videos, you just gotta donate $5 a month to me on Patreon. And speaking of money, hopefully during this month, I can finally take the plunge into doing YouTube full-time 100%. So wish me luck, you guys.